And let's kind of look over what the last week and a half is going to be about. So I want you to note that your final exam is going to be 11 a.m. to 1.30, and you will have that time in which to take your test, but it will be online, okay? So you can take the test whenever you wish. I also have in here three bonus questions, two points apiece. It's your option whether you want to take them or not, and you got two minutes to take those, those three questions, okay? So there's another six points if you want that. It's just the nature of the way that the system sets up. Yes. So you bomb all those questions. Does that count towards like? Oh, no. There's no detriment. All okay. right. There's only positive. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, there's no bad ill whatsoever. I just add the points to the final exam. Group. That's it. Okay. So um, I also want you to notice that you have a recording up for channel power. This will be on the final exam. So we talk about the uses of power, the five sources of power, understanding dependences, um, interaction with power, and how they can communicate power in your normal life and understand the importance of what power is. Um, just remember that power is important when it creates system-wide advantages for anyone. The ability to influence another corporation, its best uses when they provide system-wide advantages. Walmart's vendor-managed uh, inventory system, which allows the vendors to be able to control the goods that are in Walmart, required an enormous amount of resources for the vendors to invest in. But what it created is system-wide advantages for everyone and that's the best, most efficient use of power. All right. So I'm just wrapping that up in there. So going on to conflict. So one of my favorite old shows, because I like to watch old shows because I'm an old guy, is Perry Mason. So Perry Mason came in in the 50s. And Perry Mason actually was written by a man by the name of Earl Stanley Gardner. Um, you can still look up the um, his cases now. They are um, amazing. Earl Stanley Gardner actually chose Raymond Burr as his particular Perry Mason. So Perry Mason is an attorney, and he is the quintessential good attorney. He he lives for taking care of his customers or his clients. He is absolutely the number one when it comes to integrity above all else. One time Della walked in and, and said she had a, a friend who was being bribed and she said, Perry, how much do you believe in or what would you do for a friend? And he would say, I would go to the ends of the earth. And she said, Perry, I need $40,000. And he wrote a check right there. That's the kind of man Perry Mason was. He also tore up a check of $10,000 that was given as a bribe. And that, in, in essence, he represents the ideal. Now, on the other side of that, you had a protagonist by the name of Hamilton Berger. Hamilton Berger was the district attorney, and Hamilton Berger was played by a man by, a man by the name of William Talman. And William Talman was the quintessential individual who was a, a, a um, district attorney. Um, and these two paired off for eight seasons or nine. I am not can't remember how many it was. It was in many ways almost a worldwide phenomenon. In Germany, they would actually show the Perry Mason cases and they would have a panel of people who were watching it who were trying to guess who actually did it because it was actually a whodunit in which Perry would figure out what was happening and ultimately reveal who the actual murderer was. So I'm going to show you a couple of clips here. This is William Talman as Hamilton Berger, and you're going to see Perry Mason. There he is right there. And this is some of the arguments that would go on between the two of them. Hopefully I got the sound right. Oops, hold on. I, oh, that's right. Hold on. I might it. Let's see.
for grandstanding. Objection. Your Honor, once again, Mr. Mason is demonstrating his characteristic courtroom pirate techniques. Your Honor, it's perfectly obvious that Mr. Mason's been up to one of his usual tricks. Oh, Your Honor, I object. That's incompetent, irrelevant, and immaterial. It's also improper cross-examination. I object, Your Honor. This is improper cross-examination. It's incompetent, irrelevant, and immaterial in that it assumes a fact not in evidence. Objective two is argumentative, assuming a fact not in evidence, leading and suggestive, and utterly incompetent, irrelevant, and immaterial. Understand? So, this kind of gives you an idea of, of what... Now, one of the great things about it also is it was steeped in legal terms. So whenever you looked at it, you actually saw things that actually could exist in an actual courtroom. Now, in one episode in season three, Hamilton Burgers, one of his friends was accused of murder. And Hamilton Berger actually went to Perry Mason and asked him to please represent his friend. And with even with all of this stuff going on, he respected Perry enough to ask Perry, please represent my friend. He represented him. He found out who the real murderer is. And this is Perry and Hamilton having a about to go on a hunting trip and these are the two guys who are arguing with each other this is them at the very end you know i think i won this case so my whole point of all of this stuff that i'm going through is to try to get you to first frame and understand in your mind that conflict is not necessarily a bad thing all right Conflict will exist in your life in perpetuity. And how you handle conflict and how you understand conflict can be extremely important in your careers. It's hard, all right? Because the difficulty is, is that we're gonna talk about conflict is that can rapidly go out of control. But one of the things I want you to understand and I want to point out right now is that conflict can be a good thing. Good relationships can have conflict, especially when it's used to do things like bring out problems that need to be brought out. So without further ado, yes. So he walked Perry Mason yeah. to be able to understand those in terms of the con artist. Yeah. That's yeah. How that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty smart. I like that. Yeah, catching me as you can actually is a real story. It, it was uh, so it's Steve is totally new. Yeah, Tony Curtis did the original, by the way. Um yeah, Tony Curtis did the original yeah. one. And in the original Catch Me If You Can about the real person, um, they they designated one person to go find the thief. And it turned out to be Tony Curtis. He was spending the rest of the life ch chasing after himself. You know, after he got arrested, he was like, how did, how did he pay last in the bar? That's what I did. I studied for three months in prison. Yeah. He was a genius. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there there are those that are eidetic geniuses that are able to do those kind of things, and it's amazing. And they just don't consider the standard conformities the way they want to live. Crazy. Anyway, so let us move on, and we are going to talk about conflict. So, what is conflict? Conflict is usually thought of as something that you wish to avoid. Conflict is comes from the Latin word conflagere, which means to collide. It usually has mostly negative connotations. It usually has to do with some form of disunity, but I want you to consider conflict in a neutral term. And then once you can think of conflict in a neutral way, it can perhaps help you to understand it. So what is conflict? Conflict is a state of opposition or discord among organizations in a marketing chain. And this pertains to the, con the concept of conflict in marketing channels. So as I said, it can be thought of as neutral, 
And so realize that a certain amount of conflict is desirable. Conflict arises when one member of a channel reviews their upstream or downstream partners, not as partners, but as adversaries. It is important to understand that conflict is different from competition. Competition tends to be discussion or fighting against the environment in which you are working in. Conflict <laughs> tends to be against each other. This opposition or discord channel conflict is the behavior by a channel member that is in opposition to the wishes or behaviors of a channel counterpart. <laughs> Competitors struggle against the environment, conflict, they struggle against each other. Yes. Um, I was wondering if the final exam is cum cumulative or no. if it's this. It is this. Okay. Great. It is, yeah. Thank you for saying that. The final is chapters 10, 11, and 12. Power, conflict, and relationships. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. So, conflict does not imply incompatibility. It is just in some way, some discord that may need to be addressed in one way or another. Conflict is not universal, unidirectional, omnipotent. Conflict exists in stages. And so let us look at the types of conflict and we'll move them from one stage to the other. Now, the first thing I want to say here, <clears throat> this circle is wrong. The way this actually should go from the least conflict to the most is here to here to here to here. I don't know why they did this circle like that. But this is how it goes. Latent to perceive to felt to manifest. The first is latent conflict. Latent conflict is the norm in marketing channels. It is the inevitability that happens when parties pursue separate goals. And so we've talked about the very nature of conflict, or we've talked about the incompatibility. So. And we've talked about the channel environments intermediaries, their desire is to control markets. The manufacturers wish to sell, sell. And then of course the consumers is most options. Just briefly. Each one of these has not necessarily conflicting goals, but different goals from each other. And as they pursue those goals, it's natural for there to be conflict. In a felt conflict, it is, excuse me, in a latent conflict, conflict might exist, but it is not perceived by the members. If they ignored the conflict, it would disappear. It may exist in a way, but quite simply, they don't feel it. They don't consider it to be important. They're striving to retain their own autonomy. They compete for limited resources. Conflict by its very nature because of a certain amount of gold income being in this. Steve conflict
is when the channel members know it exists. They sense opposition of their viewpoints, their perceptions, their intentions, their behavior. Not not behaviors, excuse me. Perceived conflict is emotionless, cognitive. In other words, it's thinking. It is the recognition of a contentious opposition, but it's accepted as all in the day's work. It's the way things are. Perceived conflict actually is a good thing. Because can perceived conflict can be what we call functional conflict, and we'll talk about that later. Felt conflict is when perceived conflict starts to become emotive in state. It's an emotion. <laughs> yeah. The actors start personalizing the differences between the corporations. Those guys over at Telco and those gals over at Telco and then talking about it. In other words, the corporate corporations in essence start to take on human characteristics. You start to feel anxiety, frustration, hostility. It starts to become part of the organizational uh, memory of the corporations within each other. In other words, it starts to get passed down from one individual to the next. Don't argue with those people. Just give them what they need. Hey, well, we always do good with these guys, but be careful with themselves. That, that would be an example. Felt or effective conflict starts to become personal. You might even ignore sensible changes when they arise that could fix things. The last and the worst is manifest conflict. And this is when it is expressed visibly in behaviors, such as deliberately blocking each other's initiatives. Withdrawing support, even to the point where it hurts your own corporation. They may even sabotage each other in a deliberate fashion. And yes, this definitely gets passed through the organizational memory. Remember that conflict is a state. In other words, it's like a picture. Okay, it's like taking a picture, very much like like a, a balance sheet is. But it's also a process that can move backwards and forwards. And when you consider the conflict as a process, it also means that conflict can move from one state to the next. It all depends on how you treat it. So I had, uh, when I was playing basketball, um, there was this one guy on the other team, I, I played for the Catholics, and I played for the Catholics, it was tricky. And I couldn't take Ronald, I didn't like him. Um, and man, he, they would beat us all the time. And then one time in Church League Hall during Christmas, they didn't want him on one of his teams and he asked if he could join us. I said, sure, why not? The old, my old belief is always allow your enemy a chance to be your friend. And then Ronald joined our team and we won two league championships with him. So conflict is not perpetual. You never know. All right. You know, conflict does not have to exist as a constant state. It can change. And it's all up to the members to make a change. And so these are the types of conflict in which we move through. It's important to understand, as I've said before, conflict 
Sometimes we have a natural thing. And I think it's important to accept that it exists as a state because it can help you be able to balance it as well. So how do we actually go about measuring conflict? Is there a way to do it? And, and this is a good way to be able to encapsulate and understand whether you actually really have conflict or not. Because you might feel it, but you may not know exactly how much it is. So how do you measure conflict? You have four steps. Four steps. Now, each one of these, if I were going to do it, I would use a scale of zero to 10, okay? Zero to 10. So conflict would equal, it actually, if I was going to do it, I would say the sigma, the sum of all of the issues, but we're not going to get that fancy. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I hated that too. Um, okay. So anyway, the four steps are, the first is you would count each one of the individual issues, whether or not they happen to be functional or excuse me, whether they happen to be latent all the way to manifest. Count the number of issues that you might have. Ex assess, excuse me, assess how important each one of those conflicts is. The next is determine how frequent these conflicts come up. <clears throat> and then measure their intensity. Measure whether they are perceived conflict or manifest. Each one of those. And it's important to put them in your mind as a zero to 10 scale. Why do I say zero to 10? Because if you notice in the calculation, I'm using multiplying effect. And what happens if one of these is a zero? They're all zero. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And that's why you use a zero to 10 scale. No real conflict exists if it's petty. It rarely happens, and it's not intense. It does not create any substantial difference in distance between the partners. That's low intense. If it rarely sparks a difference of opinion, no. The great thing about this little scale is, is that if you're feeling conflict, <laughs> you can use this easy little scale as a way of determining just how big the conflict is. And so I would urge you in your own life, if you're having conflict with like members or people in your groups, just use this. It's a way of understanding. Okay. Assess whether it's felt, whether it's perceived, whether it's manifest. You can determine in your own way an understanding of whether you're in a conflict environment. And so now we're going to talk about what are the consequences of conflict. We're going to talk about it in a good way. I'm going to talk about it in a bad way. The first is we're going to talk about it in a good way. And the good way is known as functional conflict. Sometimes conflict can make things better. It can make the partners communicate more frequently. You can establish outlets 
for your grievances. You can critically review your past actions and decide whether or not you are the one creating them. Functional conflict makes the members recognize each other's contributions and understand that success depends on others. You can oppose each other without damaging your relationship. And folks, I'm telling you, this is not easy. This is hard stuff. Especially now, when we're all so much on edge. But it can be due. You can work through your differences. As long as the channel members are committed to each other, conflict can be tolerated. That's all right. We have to go? Do we have to go? <laughs> All right. It requires the members to be what's called, and this is a new word for the day, it requires us to be disputatious. Disputatious. Excuse sorry. me, I'm sorry. Pardon me. Disputatious. And disputatious means you're willing to give and take. Disputatious. If you're willing to give and take, It's just as much important as the willingness to give. Sometimes it takes one channel member showing the willingness to give, which I did with Ronald. <laughs> yeah, Ronald, come on and play. What's the big deal? And then what have you lost if you do it? Very little. What often happens, though, is that a lot of suppliers will enter into agreements with weaker members. And even worse than that is that you'll have indifference in which there's little or no opposition. And when you have no issue that you have no a strong opinion on, then you're willing to fall for anything. It is important to be able to speak to your partners about your differences. And if you can't, then you have serious issues with the partnership and perhaps you may even need to move on. But channel members can prod their partners to achieve better results through functional conflict. What it takes, though, is communication and cooperation among channel members. These can be especially difficult when you're talking about difficulties that arise from other cultures. One of the difficulties with many cultures, some Asian cultures, is the inability to say the word no. And so many times they will have difficulties in coming up with agreements because the answers are relatively yes. So I did a study on materialism. <laughs> materialism was a 16 item scale. Gardner, anyway, it's a 16 item scale. Um, materialism works in Western cultures, but it falls apart with Eastern cultures because the negatively worded seven questions do not work out into anything whatsoever in different cultures. And so that's an example sometimes of what happens. And so there's an, an intense amount of cooperative effort that has to be reached in order to reach agreements and to be able to cooperate. So this is functional conflict. This is the good. This is what <laughs> functional conflict, this makes you stronger. This is when a coach is willing to tell you when you're not doing your job and willing to create a little friction to make you be better than you are. 
manifest conflict, however, creates tension and frustration. It reduces the corporation's satisfaction to work together. And it <laughs> destroys the channel's long-term ability to function as a close partnership because it erodes in the number one thing that you need, and that is trust. So what is trust? We use this word a lot. Trust is the belief you will be acted upon in a fair manner. Trust believes that you act in fairness, with honesty, and with concern for your well-being. And in manifest conflict, trust doesn't exist. Unsatisfactory relationships diminish trust in your channel counterpart. It will create intense conflict and can even spill into other relationships with others. Because what you do is, is you start to make your other channel partners line up on your side. You're either with me or against me. And this is an example. The difficulty with manifest conflict also is it may take years to The last thing to say is when, when you're in a contentious kind of difficulty, you don't need to minimize it. You need to find a way to manage it. So during COVID, with everything that was going on, my daughters, unfortunately, were unable to go to school. With everything else, I dropped out of doing any of my research, and I stayed home, and I taught my children. I didn't need to minimize the difficulties that they were going through. I needed to manage it. <clears throat> the difference between minimizing and managing is minimizing means that you lower it's difficulty, whereas managing means you're trying to find solutions. And that's the difference. Now, as we've talked about most of the year about the way channels are, is that they're both interpersonal and independent relationships, the natural place in channels is that there are natural sources for conflict that has to be accepted from the word go. And so there are three separate areas, we'll talk about them one at a time, is that conflict is rooted, rooted in three major ones. The goals, each channel member's perception of reality, <clears throat> and the perception that they operate at <clears throat> certain levels of autonomy that you can't necessarily perceive. And so we're doing these one at a time. We're going to go through one slide at a time and talk about these in greater measure. And so let's talk about the first one, which is competing goals. Each channel member has a different goal. 
each channel member has objectives that are different from each channel member. Has anyone got an OB yet, organizational behavior? Done that in management classes? Okay, so one of the big ones is this concept known as agency theory. And I want you to kind of work through this with me. And it's one of those ways to help you understand what's going on between you and your boss, okay? So agency theory basically comes down to this. All right. You have two individuals in agency theory, all right? You have the individual known as the principal. They're the individuals that create the work. The principal acts on the agent to whom the principal delegates the work. The principal has goals and functions in that they want you to do these particular jobs. <laughs> Whereas the agents have their own purposes and reasons for being. We see this all the time, especially in academia and, and, and organizations. The, the principals have a purpose of being able to bring students into the universities and be able to have enrollments which are sufficient to be able to successfully carry on the university structure. The teachers, we have our own reasons for being in here. We're here to do research. I'm here to help you get a job. And that's to be able to impart knowledge and I hope that the knowledge helps you in whatever you can. I got into this business, not because I do research, but because I like to teach, okay? Between these two groups, we have different reasons and different purposes for going into life. If I'm in an average kind of workaday world, the principal might say, get this done by Friday. The agent is probably saying to themselves, I can't wait to get out of here and have a beer. Okay? It's a classic example. You can understand that, all right? It's not a difficult thing to understand, but just realize that the goals of this individual and this individual create conflict when we're talking about it in the principal agent relationship. This is an example of competing goals. And a lot of the tension and anxiety resents not really an actual goal clashes, but because we have different goals. <clears throat> That's it. So how do the agents and the principals get along? Well, they have to recognize that there has to be some kind of common goal in which you can both work together on. The principal has to accept and respect the agent's purpose. And the agent has to respect the principal's needs. And if you can find common ground, then there is the ability to reduce this tension as long as both sides accepts the other's reasons for existence. I wish I'd have had some of this stuff before I started the real world folks. I mean, it would have made my life so much easier. Um, I took, um, I, I, um, last class I took when I was getting my PhD was in leadership psychology. It was a book by the man by the name of Huckel. And to understand the psychology of leadership and what leaders are supposed to do would have made it a lot easier for me to understand what, what the heck was going on around me. And, and I think if you can approach that and understand where your principles are coming from, it can make it your life a lot easier. So I would just suggest that. So competing goals. The next is differing perceptions in reality. And this does go back to this. We have 
different responses for the same situation. Because the manufacturer has a different perception of reality than the intermediaries, they have different information and different influences in their lives. And of course, as I've said, the problems exist in domestic markets, but especially in foreign markets and in international settings when we just quite can't understand how things are. Walmart's great difficulties, especially when they were trying to expand overseas, is their inability to be able to perceive the, the other markets that they were trying to get into. They failed miserably in Europe. Um, they got bumped around in India. They were convicted of, well, yeah, indicted and convicted of bribery in India because of their own clumsiness in the way that they did it. And yet they succeeded in China, ironically, and they've succeeded in South and Central America. The way that you can achieve some success is through better communication and greater cultural sensitivity. Understanding what your partners are going through is the first step to getting this different perceptions of it is amazing and and i talk about this a lot it's amazing that we're not constantly at war with each other because just of the difficulties that it causes in speaking and the way that we think um the words that we use are so completely different in, in their thoughts and in the way we we are i mean words do not completely translate even though we have dictionaries that say that we do, because the perceptions and the realities within them don't translate as well. It requires a lot of trust, that belief that you're being acted on in a fair manner. So anyway, a lot of this has to do, once again, finally with the word focus. The supplier focuses on products and processes, the downstream intermediaries focus on the functions of those goods and their customers, both differing points of view. The last, oh, excuse me. The final is intra-channel competition. What can happen many times is, is that a supplier whose goal is to sell as many possible, there can be conflict that their downstream partners represent competitors and don't believe they represent them as well. And so if I am a product franchise and not a business format franchise, and I have multiple items that I sell, there's always the sense that the buyer has is that you're not pushing their brand sufficient. The downstream or the upstream is, is that I wanna have as many of these out so I can exploit the economies of scale and I pull all the demands together from my upstream or from my downstream partners so that I can make more and sell more and be able to make more money. Suppliers sense the conflict when you have many direct competitors and I want to control a given market. And that means I want to be able to sell as many different brands as I can. And the truth is, is that in the long run, the manufacturer and the consumer both want the same thing. And the intermediaries want and desire something quite different. The customer wants to be able to have as many brands and more options in whatever way possible. The upstream manufacturer wants to sell as many as well in as many different places as they can. And the intermediaries want to be able to control a market. 
They want to be able to set where those goods are sold. And this process of disintermediation, as I've talked about it, is the desire to wipe the intermediaries off the face of the earth. And the truth is that intermediaries are so valuable and so important that if we went to a direct channel scheme, it would blow the grits, in the words. This heightens up the difficulty that it has when you have more than one route to get to the market. Many suppliers desire to change their channels and technological advances have certainly made it feasible. And this is where the Omni channel puts its toe into the market or let's just say it kind of throws their shoe in the works and makes things difficult because this is where the omni-channel creates that channel pollution. So as I said, suppliers and customers love multiple channels. They want to be able to get it from the most possible place that they can. Suppliers want to increase their market penetration and customers increase those to find as many outlets as they can. Now, it is true that suppliers do desire the omni-channel and create more channels, but the important thing about the multi-channel or the omni-channel environment, as I've said before, is it's better when you're chasing different market segments instead of finding just multiple ways to produce or sell those goods. When you have multiple channels present in the same geographic market, along with foot sluggers, Mass General Store, uh, Academy Sports, you have all of these places to get outdoor uh, winter equipment. The downstream partners may lose their motivation. They may even withhold their support. It may reduce their depth and their vigor to help. Suppliers can't understand it, the agency theory, because they believe everything is well balanced, everything's working. Well, the problem also with that is, is that consumers are fickle. They'll move about. They'll use the Omnichannel. They'll buy online, pick up in store. <clears throat> and so what suppliers have to quite, quite simply recognize is that the consumer is a moving target And recognize that with a partnership with the intermediaries, they can they can achieve what they could not achieve alone. And especially, and I've said this more than one time, especially when there's high risk in whatever you're selling. Okay, when a failure to sell well, you know, can cause an issue. So are there ways in which multiple markets have no conflict? Yes. Here's an example, three examples, when there are multiple markets without an increase in conflict. When markets are growing, the pie is getting bigger and everyone is doing well. When the consumers perceive that each unique market is differentiated, different, which is one of the reasons why in multiple channels you need to find ways of going after different consumers is important. <clears throat> and then finally, 
when the buyer's purchasing in style involves one type of champion and one alone. The consumer who will always go into their pharmacy, go look directly at their pharmacist, always buy in that one way. That is a, that is the avoidance of a multi-channel company. I'm telling you what's really buggering up right now um, is if you look at what's happening in the fast food industry, mm -hmm. the ordering of your food on your phone now and then picking it up, that is creating chaos. And this is, especially this is a franchise thing that's come along that has, it has to be accepted by the franchisees because it's contract. But you have no idea what's going on inside the stores where they're trying to, to be able to handle goods coming in online, ordering them, putting them together, figuring out where they are outside, or buying when they come in the store, getting their order through the drive through or ordering through the drive through and then taking care of people in the store. It's chaos. You have no idea. Multiple channels without conflict is a very rare thing. Mostly you're going to have conflict. Now, one of the ways that you can avoid that is realize that multiple channels do not automatically compete. So when Coca-Cola came out with their, their um, vending machines outside of super, supermarkets, the grocery stores went bazonkers. In the 30s and the 40s, when Coca-Cola started selling vendings outside the stores, the, the supermarkets demanded that Coca-Cola move them because they were saying that the individuals, you were taking away individuals who were coming into the stores. Coca-Cola, first, because they had such enormous power, they could ignore those issues. But Coca-Cola was also able to successfully argue and say, no. This isn't a competitor. This is actually a leader. This is something that's bringing people into our store because the individuals that buy a single Coke outside are going to be different people than those that come inside and purchase a liter. Somebody can buy a 10 ounce or 12 ounce Coke outside for the same amount of money it costs to get a liter inside. <laughs> and what they found is that once they understood this, they actually found that vending machines brought people into the store. My, my brother will drive 10 miles out of the way to a Walmart so he can get a Coke for 50 cents. And I get on him every time about this. And he called me up one day and he said, the world has ended. They've gone to 75 cents. I said, welcome to the real world. So anyway, multiple channels can help one another by building primary demand. They can become loss leaders. They get consumers to where you want to go. If you have a combination of a store and a direct marketing operation, you can actually create good. If you work in a cooperative manner. It doesn't help all the time, but it can work. I want to also say one other way in which you can manage multiple channels. One other way that you can manage multiple channels is to set up what's called a flagship product line. A special product line as a manufacturer that is sold through a particular channel. And then you can sell secondary products in a separate channel. The MacBook Pros are sold through universities and the Apple stores and online, but they will not sell through Walmart. Walmart sells the iPads, the iPhones, and all the peripheral equipment, but Apple considers those goods to be too important to sell in any other way. And they're very successful doing it. And so that is the way 
that you can manage multiple channels in through the process of differentiation. And this actually works. Okay. I have done enough on channels for today. We will finish channels on Thursday, and I will try to move as quickly as we can into chapter 12. So have a good day. I should have all your tests graded by Wednesday. Have a good one.